It's showtime again. Each week and every week, we are so blessed to be able to turn on that camera and come to you in your little iPhones, right? Laptops, all that good stuff through all the different portals that we have. But I must give a big, big shout out to Mr. TikTok. You don't stop rocking all the time. People are loving with all our clips that we're putting on, and we're gaining so many new followers and so many younger um, soldiers that are into dance music is starting to follow the show now. It was a good move, a step into TikTok, because those that know Lenny said, I ain't doing no TikTok. It don't stop rocking nothing. I didn't want to do it. But like every time I have to pick my right foot and my left, put it right in my mouth and say, I'm glad the powers around me said, do the TikTok thing because you're going to see a difference. And I'm telling you, it's gaining quick speed. Because originally when TikTok started, I was like, this is silly. But now we're starting to see now that people are starting to look at it from documentarian side of it. You know, like with the podcast and things. We're able to share our, you know, our thoughts, you know, clips from older shows. You know, we're going on a couple of years now. And we got a lot, a lot of great content. We've done a lot of great people. And we're going to be doing more great people because I feel like we haven't even touched the surface yet of what history has in store for us. You know what I'm saying? It's, you know, the more I do this show, the more I thank God that in a dark period of time, I decided to do something and get these shows document, you know, onto to some sort of video. Because what I'm finding as we're turning older, all of us, and even the young ones too, we're losing people. We're losing people around us. And we don't want that to be where you never got to hear those stories. You can never go back. These stories are very important for what will come up in front. Next part. I want to let you all know that the prayer warriors are working. I asked you all to pray for Kathy Brown. I just got off the phone a little while ago. I rang her cell and I wanted to ask, here I am again, sorry. I wanted to ask how she was doing and she said, you know, it's like anything in life, it's not easy to deal with, right? But she's a trooper, another soldier, an alumni of True House Stories. I've worked with her. Many other producers and DJs worked with her. She's worked with a lot of record labels. And in house music, she's one of our diva gods. You know what I'm saying? You put a microphone in front of her and she just wows a crowd. And that's a diva god to me. You know, and we must respect our friends, our divas, because this business is a tough business. I'm not going to lie. And a lot of us... I can't say a lot of us, but not all of us have the proper situations in hand, like, you know, um, having care, medical insurance, or a large endowment of cash. You know, a lot of us are not trust fund babies. A lot of us came from the streets. And what I mean from the streets, I mean, you know, starting from nothing, not even two nickels or two pennies or two pence to rub together to get to that level and work hard from gig to gig, strength to strength, you know, and also at moments in your life where you get discouraged and you don't want to do this anymore. And those that know this business know that not only is it a passion, but you have to be in it wholeheartedly. And if you don't come from a rich family, you got to have to kind of play this juggling game to make it. You know what I'm saying? You have to play the game. You got to balance it all. You got to be part of the social media game. You got to be part of doing what makes you known, um, producing your music, writing. You know, there's a lot of things involved. You know, if you're a DJ, you try constantly hustling for work. If you're a vocalist, you're constantly hustling. You're trying to get new records out. You're trying to keep yourself relevant. And along the way, something gets lost. You know what that is? Time and sometimes your health. Two things you don't get back. 
You know what I'm saying? And take that to consideration, everyone. Time and health. Because once time is behind you, it's now looking forward. And when you can't look forward anymore, what happens? You fall behind. Some of our people have left us due to non-working, mortality reasons, health issues. Just couldn't cut it anymore. But this lady right here, Kathy Brown, she's a fighter. She's got stage four lung and brain cancer. And we're raising the family. Letitia Green, her daughter, organized the fundraiser. So please go to GoFundMe and give even a dollar, two dollars, whatever. They're trying to raise 50000 I think they're about $21,000 now. The family and Kathy are going to be hit with a crap load of expenses when this is over. So she wanted to tell everybody Rehab will begin and treatment. She had two surgeries. And when I spoke to her, she sounded as upbeat and as beautiful and told me she loves all of you and loves me and all of you together. So please, by all means, give what you can. Share this and put out there that, you know, you're, you're fighting for Kathy to make it, to make it and make it strong. Because, you know, those positive thoughts... Those positive thoughts go a long, long way. Welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And we're taking it back, way back, back into time with Soulful House, Deep House, the man himself, one of the rulers of the underground, all the way from Brooklyn through Zanzibar and the world. You may know him from one of his main singles in the beginning on a major label on Warner Brothers. I'm going to let him tell you all about it because I've been singing it to him. He laughs every time I see him. 35 years later, I'm still singing it to him. He starts laughing. He goes, here you go. <laughs> I'm not going to sing it now. But he's talented. What he thought he was going to begin. In other words, producing. And then, but maybe singing, it wasn't like the singing thing was it the main focus. It was more, he, he came in like a lot of brothers come in with the thought, I want to make great records. I want to make records that stand the test of time. I want to do things that may make changes, you know? And sometimes along the way, like a mad scientist, when you're in that situation, mixing things, it doesn't always work out the way you want. And that's where you learn from the mistakes that make you better next time around. And we all know this. If anyone's ready ever to throw a stone, I cannot be one because I've made a load of mistakes myself. And part of the mistakes on the journey is to learn from and to master out and keep this going. The question I asked myself, did any of one of us think in the beginning of this house music thing, that decades later, we would still be talking about it and still making it and doing it, but now in a different, a little bit of a different way. We're still doing it with the core. We may not actually have the analog gear anymore. Some of us are work, working all digital now, and some of us work with some analog and digital, you know. But did any of us ever think in the beginning what we started with? which was like raw beats, drum machines, synthesizers, and all that stuff all go into the box. We're going to find out in one moment when I bring this man up. And the last thing I have to say, again, when we all began, all any one of us wanted to do was, especially him, and I'm going to say his name loud, Brooklyn's own Jovan. When Jovan wanted to do it, all he wanted to do was make great records. He didn't care what it took. He didn't care what instrument he needed. He went out there. He says, I'm going to make, and I remember him telling me, I, I just want to make great records. So welcome to the show. Brooklyn Zone to Zanzibar in the world. Body and Deep owner, Gold Tone Records, Jovan. What's up? What's good? What's good? What's good? <clears throat> Welcome to the show, Mr. Jovan. You're admired and loved by many, many people around the world. 
sir. Especially New York, you know, you're a New Yorker strife at height. Indeed, indeed. I share that with you. <laughs> I share that New York thing with you. No matter where you go, we always bring it home. It's like, yo, it's all about home. Absolutely. So first off, how are you? Tell us where you're at in your life right now. I'm good, feeling good, and um, just grinding, man. You know, trying to finish the album, uh, doing other projects with other people, remix projects, uh, collaboration, stuff like that. So, you know, I got a lot going on, you know? Saying that, but that's usually now part of the swing of things, that you have to be involved in many different pieces of this game to be actually able to make it now, right? Oh, absolutely, man. I mean... Right about now, I mean, you know, I would say to the to the newcomers of you know of the industry world, your music is your calling card, you know, um, is your business card actually, you know, because it's like it ain't that easy to get in, but then again, it is because everybody's a self-contained uh, label owners because of the download and stuff like that, because not everybody's pressing records. And back and back at the time, you know, I always say this: you had to be committed financially. Oh, make yeah. sure that you had it right to get that wax out there. It's not like now; you could just throw stuff out digitally. There's no expense to that, except you do some marketing money. Yeah, we're talking about when you have to do straight vinyl hard. This this cabbage involved a lot of cabbage. You know, people don't get that. They think it's like, oh, yeah, I'll make a record. Yeah, now you can just turn on the gear and, you know, your laptop and do things and make it snap, crackle, pop, add water, stir, ma. I got tang, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But ain't like that back then. No, no. I mean, you know, the, uh, I'm amazed how people can actually just come out of the box and say, hey, I want to be a producer and I want to be a, a DJ these days, you know, and, you know, it's kudos to those people that want to do these things, because I think we give them that inspiration of wanting to be a producer. There ain't that much singers, I've noticed, you know, everything is instrumental. There's not a whole hell of a lot of, uh, you know, singers out there these days, and if it is, they're one-liners, you know, uh, they just sing like a, a hook. And there's your record, you know. Um, but for us, from us, where we come from, your title is your record, and there's the artist, and you have a whole song, you know, from beginning to the end. Bars, eight bars, 16 bars, 32 bars, or the whole damn song with one singer, no background vocals. That was the raw core of, you know, how it, it started as far as house music is concerned. All right, Jovan. Before we get any deep into that conversation, we need to take it back. Okay. We got to take it right back before this even begins. Jovan, we know the Jovan. We're talking about the kid, you know, when AM radio was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When AM radio was, when I always call AM radio almost music because there was no FM in that time when you were listening to AM radio. Oh, man. Yeah, I so was. Take I us was, back. Go ahead. Yeah, I was this little kid that stayed in the room you know, drawing pictures and listening to the little transistor radios that only had FM, I mean, uh, AM on it. And my favorite DJ back then was uh, DJ Dan Aykroyd. Uh, Ingram, sorry, Dan Ingram. And um, I know a lot of people might know who that is. If you're from New York, you might know Dan Ingram. Uh, he played a lot of certain records, but it was mostly rock and roll, you know? So you had your Captain Tennille's and Kiss, or, or even before that, their time, because that's the disco era at that point. Um, but I was always listening to a lot of rock music, and I grew up listening to rock music up until Dan Ingram started playing uh, soul music, you know, Rita Franklin, um, Diana Ross, you know, some a few soul records out there, you know. It, it, it was coming around, and there was no FM radio at the time. So, but, um, you know, I think that 
just listening to a lot of those old records back then, it for some reason I was always humming to whatever that they were playing it. Like if I was a musician, I don't understand why I did it, but I did. Um, I would listen to these songs and, you know, it was kind of like, I would just go, man, if they had a bass line that goes like, mm, 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 you know, whatever, you know, I would just hum, or, hum out. Even like if uh, somebody like, um, what's her face, uh, Aretha Franklin, but she did rock steady. And that bass line was like one of the funkiest thing that I've ever heard, you know, that do, 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 I was just like, damn. And I was just like, oh, they put a string in there right at this certain part. I was always emphasizing, never knowing somewhere in the future that I would be this uh, future producer, you know, because I was always thinking about what I'm listening to. Um, but yeah, listening to a lot of rock music back then was good. And then when soul music kicked around, you had BLS. I mean, I'm sorry, FM radio. I don't know what actually station it was at the time. And it could have been BLS because it was we had Frankie Crocker, you know, who yeah. gave us uh, soul music, you know. And so let's say somewhere in like 72, 73 or something like that. When I first got to hear records like Love is the Message, MFSB, and um, a whole lot of stuff you wouldn't have never thought, you know, a lot of James Brown music and stuff, you know. Um, Whoever would have thought how how intense and how killer it was that, you know, if your radio wasn't on, Frankie Crocker's not on, how important that was at that time, what he did in New York for all of everyone, you know? Yeah, absolutely. For young people like us at the time, we were like, wow. You know, yeah. that music was never heard before. <laughs> right. No, it wasn't. I mean, you know, if you did get to hear that kind of music, it was because of uh, when park jams started, when DJs was playing, you know, in the parks. You know, rather you had just like the one turntable and a little speaking a, in a receiver this you know i had some of the guys that would come outside with just that up until they you know when we had that new york city blackout that's when everybody ended up with equipment all of a sudden you know and that those are the days of uh park jam day started out and that's when i got more involved with what's going on on the dj side of things so i started out more so as a dj did it as a being a musician um, but going back, my parents were musicians and singers, you know, um, they backed up the, uh, well, my pops told me that, you know, they backed up with the, the, the Supremes, the Motown, Motown days, you know, they didn't, they never went forward with the business, you know, as far as making records or anything like that, you know, moving forward, they just kind of like, they was like that opening group. You know, so after they became that opening group, you know, they used to rehearse in the house. Uh, uncle used to play the bass. Uh, on, on my father's side, uh, my uncle, my other uncle on my mother's side played the drums. My mother was, was lead singer, my father lead singer, lead guitar player. And they used to rehearse in the living room. And I used to just sit there and listen to them. And I was just like, you know, just kind of intrigued on watching a live band and, and seeing them sing and stuff like that. So um, at the end of the day, um, you know, my father told me how to play the lead guitar and uh, uncle told me how to play bass. The other uncle told me how to play live drums. I'm not that great with the live drums. I think I do, I think I do all right more kind of that, you know, but that was it for me, you know, <laughs> but I never really gone deep into being a drummer, I think I got more into the keyboard things down the line, but you know, but before I get into that, that was just more like watching how they create songs or put together a song in the household, you know, just watching them, you know, write songs and singing it, listening to them do harmonies with my mom and her sister, my mom's is a twin, you know, and um, they were, I was just like, taking all of this in, still not knowing that I'm going to be a producer down the future, you know? I was just more or less like taking in everything I saw 
and um, I just kind of, you know, kind of ran with it. What was your the par- your parents' group name? That um, do you remember what the name of the group was? That when they were on tour with the, I was too young. I was too young. I so never was knew. Dad that. working a regular job too. Or was it was that a weekend thing that they were doing? Yeah, they, yeah, they were doing a weekend thing. You know, as far as you know, gigging and stuff like that. But you know, my father used to work in the city. You know, and uh, mom was working as well. And um, you know, on the weekends, come Friday, the band was in the house, you know, or in the middle of the week, they would rehearse. So you'd be seeing all that, basically, and not realizing you're sponging either. No, no, not at all. Did yeah. you have any formal training in high school or, or middle school as far as musical instruments? No, actually, my mom's taught me how to play keyboard. That's I think that's where I landed my my gift more so because she told me how to play chords. First thing I've ever learned was uh, lean on me, you know? And um, that was like the beginning to, to my present right now. So it was all of that, dun, 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 you know? So I was just like, oh, this is cool. So I was just learn how to do that. And then I started listening to a lot of other music and kind of emulate chord structure. Um, my uncle uh, taught me how to, you know, listen to a lot of the instruments on whose who's part is who's doing what. So we listened to a lot of jazz. We used to sit on the floor and listen to jazz music. And, um, you know, he would just point out certain things. He'd go, that's the horn, you know, when you, when you do this. And the, the, the pianos or the organ or what have you, you know, I knew what the bass player and drummer were. You know, but he would teach me the, the jazz elements of what was being played at the time. And I was just kind of like, okay, and, you know, still not thinking about being a producer, <laughs> you know. Um, would you have known what a producer was really unless someone, no, you wouldn't have known. I never knew what a it producer was- was there any such thing called Mr. Google or a computer to show you anything? Nah, you a video? <laughs> <laughs> no. Was there any of that? Like Mr. Google from Google Network? Not a damn thing. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to explain to everybody. This is yeah. this, how I mean, ache was it back then? Tell people what you had to do to go figure this out. You either had to read a book or a magazine or a TV show. You know, so that's that's basically what we went with. Um, you know, it was, it was just, or, or watching an interview on TV. So there was no such thing as research and learning how to do stuff. Everything that I've learned was just through eyesight, just more or less just watching and listening, you know, um, you know, being taught, but I think I took in a lot because I'm self, self-contained, self-taught as uh, being a producer or you know, okay a- all right so let's define that a little bit brother man people you know because somebody's asking the question and saying this what exactly do you mean what a music producer does well a, a music producer is somebody who who can arrange a track produce a track as a whole you know like let's say um there's there's two different types of producers in my book um, to me, I'm going to take it from myself. I'm a producer because I sit there and I create a bass line. I create my own chords. I create my drums, my drum pads, everything. I do everything, which is a producer, even writing a song from time to time, you know? Then you got other producers who, somebody like, um, like Louis Vega, you know, masters at work, when Louis could come in the studio and he can point out, I want you to create a, a bass line that's going to work with those drum pads Kenny Dope might have done. I want this guy to do the strings. I want y'all to write a song after we come up with the initial foundation track. You know, that's another type of producer. You know, so. I, but in my, in my opinion, I feel like you're more than that. I feel like you're more the conceptual writer yeah. that takes the writing part to a different height, to a production yeah. level. Yes. 
Now, there's a funny one, everyone. Here's the best one. Executive producer. What does that person do? You ready? They put the money up. (laughs) (laughs) The executive producer. You ever seen that, everyone? Executive producer, blah, blah, blah. When you see that, normally they're the one. And the intrinsic inside to that. Yes. So Jovan's more of the scientific writer where he literally will sit down and put his drums, you know, like most produce. I, I'm assuming that you start that way. You put lay a drum track down, right? Yeah, definitely. <coughs> lay a drum, <coughs> excuse me, lay a drum, <coughs> drum track down and then start to put some sort of chord progressions or a bass line, whatever you're hearing. It could right. be a string, a rose, whatever it is, an organ, because that's what, you know, the, today's term producer is get the record done and hand it off, right? But back in the day, in the 70s, even the 60s, they had what they called the arranger, yeah, the writer. Another the, word for conductor. Right. And who would write down the actual page was the writer. So Jovan would be the guy writing. Yeah. Then he'd be the conductor later. And tell everybody, right, Javon, you'd say, do this. I need you to play that part because yeah. there was no synthesizers. Later on, when we had MIDI, then you could be the what we call one man in the box. That's it. Were. So the, let's give him some flowers to Jovan because he's <laughs> not only writing, he's sitting there putting it together. He's producing. And then at the end, he's mixing it as well, yeah. meaning... He's making sure you're getting the right sounds blended together to get that final song to sound what you guys are used to getting from Jovan. Mm-hmm. So I hope that answers the question to everybody's asking out there what a producer does. And that's what Jovan is trying to explain to producers. And there's a few other ways of looking at it, but he kind of gave it the right direction. I like the way he explained it. It's exactly right. So Jovan... Did your mom and dad sway you away from trying to go into this music thing? Or, we, or you know, because everybody talks about that in the beginning. It's like, you know, in those days, it was tough to even think to make it at any kind of level in this game. No, um, they didn't sway me um, from it. I think because I think by the time I turned, uh, I don't know, eight, nine years old or something like that, I was more into collecting music. I was buying 45s and I always liked certain records and certain sounds and stuff like that. And, um, you know, my very first record I've ever bought <laughs> was um, El Coco. Actually, it was the 12 inch, the first uh, 45. And I, you know, there was a quiz real quick about that with Louie and all of them. And everybody was like, what was the first 12 inch ever made? as a 12 inch long 45 and I'm yelling at the screen. It's El Coco, Coco motion. You know, that's, that's what I saw because I ain't seen nothing else besides that particular record was El Coco, um, Coco motion. And, um, I bought that record and, um, I, to that, that very same record as a kid, I still have it. But, but in 1976, which is a year prior, yeah. You had you had Walter Gibbons do that long extended version of um oh god I I, I know I can't think of it, but anyways on South Soul and everybody always fights over that as being the first twelve inch commercially acceptable you know it was uh, available but I understand the long forty five mm-hmm. at El Coco Motion was a forty five RPM record on yeah. twelve inch right only two songs A and B. So that's crazy. So you got you went out and bought that, huh? Yeah, yeah. I took my allowance money and bought that. Got yelled at, of course. But I kept buying records. Um, only f- because I saw, you know, DJs was on the rise. I didn't know what was going on. It was just like a neighbor that used to come outside with his, you know, you know, his home speakers and he had these BSR turntables. Remember that? The BSR turntables. And he would have those, had no pitch control, but he was just throw music on. And uh, he had two receivers. So when he cut off one, he would just play the other. He ain't had no mixer. 
but he would just do that. But then when I saw a real DJ, you know, that actually had a set, was a neighbor that used to play music real loud. I used to come from school, but I didn't know I was about 10. And he would just be blasting all the time. And I would just go past him. And one day I just got tired of it going past his window. I said, I want to see this man set. You know, I want to see what he got. Right. And you could see smoke coming out of his house. So, you know, the dude smoked a lot of weed, you know, and um, he would have his windows cracked open on a spring day and stuff like that. And I'm just like, okay. Back then, you could go into a stranger house that you don't know and can come right back out. You know, today, you, you just can't do that. You know, anyway, I knocked on his door. I said, can I, can I see your set? He said, yeah, come on in, you know, you know, so I looking at he had the the whole like big base bottoms in his living room. He had no furniture except the one couch. So he's sitting there rolling up weed while he's talking. I said, well, I want to ask you a question. How do you mix one record to the next record? He had a Bozak mixer. I've never seen it at the time. And he was playing uh, George Duke dance. So. He said, when this record go off, I want you to go in that crate and find something that you know and play it. So I found Roy Ed's Everybody Loved the Sunshine. So I put that there. He said, well, put the headphones on, and when you, when you hear the beginning of it, whip it back just a notch. And when the other song ends, let it go. So I did just that. Smoothed the record right in. There was no mixing. It was just transitioning, you know. He told me how to transition the record for the most part. And I kept doing it for like about two, three hours or something like that, knowing I was supposed to be back at home. Coming from school, parents looking for me, had no idea where I was at. I come home smelling like weed, you know? Where the hell you been? My father looking in my eyes, you been smoking? I was just like, no, I wasn't smoking. I was at this DJ house. And- you smoke it. Yeah. You smoke it. You smell yeah. like that damn shit, boy. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's going off on me. You know, I was about to get my ass whooped and all kinds of shit, you know. So I'm sitting there like this is real, everybody. Take this I in. This is real. This I is real talk. Was learning how to DJ. What DJ? What DJ? So what do you mean DJ? What, right. what, 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 right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, my fault. Yeah, I'm gonna it's DJ it's on your ass right, right now. Right. I'm going to DJ you a new, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I'm going to DJ you a new asshole. So he took me out the house. We went over to the guy house. He opened the door. It's a puff of smoke. You know, he said, um, this is my son. And, uh, you know, what are you doing? He said, well, he asked me to, you know, to teach him how to DJ. You know, his name was KC, you know. And, um, you know, he said, he said, was he smoking? He said, no, I would never give a kid, you know, at the time they called it reefer. That's you know, right. They called it reefer back then. Nickel bag. Reefer. Yeah, nickel bag, reefer, whatever the hell. It was called reefer. And, you know. I wouldn't give you a boy. I wouldn't give you a son no reefer. You got your mind? I could hear the guy saying it too. Are you yeah. out of your mind? Yeah. So, you know, he was like, um, yeah, you know. So I was just like looking at them i was like my father got a hot head i hope he don't smack this dude you know know, being in the man's house so he said okay so i we went home and then um he had a talk with me he said you come home you bring your ass home you don't stop nowhere you come straight home blah 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 blah, you know and i don't want you in that guy's house because he's smoking you know i didn't understand what he was talking about to me it just looked like a cigarette you know it just stinks that's all. I didn't know the man was getting lit back then, you know. So <laughs> anyway, I used to uh, fantasize about being a DJ. I used to draw pictures and stuff like that. One day I'm going to be a DJ. I used to draw these pictures. And my sister, um, you know, was just sitting there looking at me. She was like, you're going to be a DJ. You're going to do something. I could tell. And I never knew. I said, are you serious? She said, yeah. She said, That's what you're going to end up doing. And I never really took it to heart. I just knew I wanted to have a set. So, you know, at the end of the day, I ended up with my DJ on my own set. The only one on the block with a full DJ set, big speakers, two turntables, a a Gemini Gemini mixer, two techniques, um, 
a BGW power amp, a stage echo chamber, all mines, right? Um, and I we learned how to cipher the power in the streets. You know, we used to get this this fat guy that used to hang out with us, and we used to make him do stuff. You know, because he didn't care. And it's like go go to the light post and cipher. You know, open up the electricity. And he would just clip the two wires, put the set, you know, across the street in the park and take the, the extension cord all the way. And then he would wire them together, hoping that he don't get shocked, you know. And um, power used to come on. Everybody was like, yay, you know, and we would just start jamming, you know. And um, the, the more I got into that, the more I started looking at other DJs, how how to really mix you know it was it was more important to listen to that because you know back then i used to listen to the, the radio and they used to have this called the uh oh um oh man it was something something night midnight something on bls it used to have these disco shows on the radio like uh from 12 o'clock to like five in the morning and stuff like that you know and it used to be these disco shows, and I would sit up there with my cassette and record, just listening to the DJ mix record after record, you know. And I've never been to a club and stuff like that, so maybe somewhere about the time I was 13 years old, my cousin, uh, older cousin, used to go to the clubs, and he would tell me about these parties and the records that they played. And there was this club called Red Light out in Bushwick. And he was like, he would just talk about it. So I remember one day we were walking, going to the movies. And he said, that's the red light. And I kept looking at it. I was looking at the street. So another weekend I came to spend a night over there. He went out, you know, go hang out with his buddies because I was too young to hang out at a club. So I snuck out the house and I went to that club, you know, and they actually let me in. It wasn't packed, you know, but it was, you know. They let me in and I was watching this DJ playing on Kep Electric, War Dance. It was the first time I heard that record. War Dance was on on South Soul. So I was just like, wow. You know, and I'm just watching him mixing record after record. And I'm like standing there looking at a real club until I got caught. You know, by the time I was like all of this, getting into the music, I turned around and my uncle was standing there with his hands on his hips like, get your ass out the club right now. And, Grab me by the shoulder. I was gonna ask you, weren't you nervous at all when you were there? Like thinking, oh man, I'm gonna get busted. I'm gonna someone's gonna find me. I didn't think they would find me in that club. Like, who would know that I was think scheming on? Yeah, going who the hell the thought who did yeah, who maybe you know, because it wasn't that far from where they lived. And being that I liked music so much, and it was all about DJ, and he must have thought let me just walk in there and see him. And so maybe, hang on, Javon, back in the day. And you know this for a fact. You always ask the question, how the hell did my mom and dad knew what was going on? Yeah. <laughs> did you always ask that question? Because I said, how the hell? Always, always. Somebody alerted them. It was like it was like a GPS tracking back then, the neighborhood tracking. People knew their kids. Parents knew where their kids was. Yo, that's such and such son. Yeah. What's he doing? Where's he? Yeah. Yo, he went up in that club. He ain't old enough to go in that club. Call his mama. It's it's when the neighborhood used to dime drop on you. You know, they were just like. You always be wondering, you. how the hell did they know? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure a neighbor saw me, you know. And 100% because your uncle probably was running around saying, you, did you see my nephew? Yeah. Oh, like, yeah, he worked in that? He looking at me. He's like. um, What you think you're doing? That's yeah. said, what, you, what do you think you're doing? I'm thinking I'm 13 years old trying to be grown. I'm grown now. You know, I'm 13. I'm 20. 20. <laughs> I was like, I'm 13. What are you talking about? Uh, he said, you know what? I'm going to tell your father. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. My father's just going to just really whoop my ass, you know. So uh, I apologize to no end the next day. And I was scared to go home. But, you know, I went anyway. But. Needless to say, I was just so in tune about DJs. It was just such an amazing thing to see and see a sound system, hear a sound system, and watch a DJ operate on a set. And it was kind of like such an important thing for me to ever, you know, witness as a kid. 
and I would be in my house practicing on a school night. The only time I got busted every time I was practicing in the middle of the night, knowing I got to go to school in the morning, it's the damn lights that used to run across the. You remember that that uh, the Gemini mixer with the light that used to go across? Yeah. With, with the five EQs on the right hand side, I have one of those, and um, you know, I guess that light would used to raise up the room, and I would have it pitch, pitch black inside the room, but the like light a rainbow of love. And my mom's standing right there. And she said, don't make me take, don't be, don't make me regret having this, you know, getting this stuff for you. You know, her and my dad, he was like, take your ass to bed and deal with this in the morning. I mean, you know, on the weekends. Like, All right, fine. But I was just always learning my craft for the bottom line. And I was like, you know, I used to wonder how records were being made. Never knew how records were being made, you know, um, I think I should have been a rich dude years ago, man, because I was this experimental kid way before I got my DJ set. I remember I mentioned the uh, the little transistor radio. I used to take the, uh, pop the wires out of the little radio, right? Had these two little strings and I had these two, uh, yeah, about maybe about that big, two size speakers. And I would take the wires and connect them onto that radio and I used to call it my first boom box <laughs> when nobody was doing it. And I made a handle, like I would screw the handles on top of it, lock the two speakers in and make the hole in the back so I could change the battery when it dies. So I used to have my own boom box. And people was like, how do you do that? I'm like, there's a little radio. I used to like glue it, you know, stamp it onto this thing so it won't move when I take it outside. And I had, to me, I had like the first boom box, man, you know, but anyway, I was just so in tune about, you know, just the sound of music, blah, 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 how the records were being made, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, South Soul Records, when they was busting out all of these, you know, uh, nice and nasty, you just the right size, you know, those records was just like hustle records, you know, as we call it back then. Um, chic came out with Dance, Dance, Dance. Was, I think that was their first record, if I'm not mistaken. Yowza, yowza, yowza. Yeah, that was their first record. You know, I bought that when it came out, 12 inch. You know, um, but you know, as time went along, when I got older, um, I think I was just more like, I was, you know, involved with the whole cutting and scratching. I was more of a hip hop DJ. You know, not only just house music, I was a hip hop DJ playing, cutting and scratching. I had MCs and stuff like that. And I thought maybe one day we'll make a record, something like that. We used to have routines just like for some Ds. And we used to meet them on the boat all the time. And we used to battle rap those guys. We used to go up in Harlem and battle against the Zulu Nation DJs. And I won, you know, they didn't like that. You know, I won because they played for like two and a half hours on the set. And it, I forgot, uh, this club called Chills or something way back up in, I think, 145th Street, somewhere. Anyway, I was, you know, they, they played for at least about two and a half hours. I played three records and I won because my MCs had the better routines. Uh, I was the DJ cutting and scratching, blah, 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 you know? And, you know, from that point on, they didn't like it. We got robbed, unfortunately, because it was like about 50 of them out in the street with pipes and, you know. Food. That's what I was gonna ask you. I was gonna ask you about that. If you got- you know, pinned against the wall and they took my boom box, a real boom box, it was a JVC. Uh, they took our turntables. And, our guy that we came in with with the van left us because he knew what was going on. Nice, yeah. nice punk, you know, real nice. Us. So we were left having to have to, you know, travel back home, you know. But anyway, I won. You know, they never took the money, but they took they took the set. You know, so was that, that the era during the sheepskin era? Yeah. Yeah, they were wearing sheepskins, but this happened in the summer, oh. you know, when we got robbed. And, um, you know, I was kind of like, I'm sick of this. 
first of all, you know, when I was doing the DJ battles against different people, I got tired of getting shot at. You know, they would just shoot up the place or, you know, and I got tired of running because I was winning. People was hating on me back then and stuff like that. And I was just like, you know what, man, I'm tired of this. I'm going to do something else. That's when production started kicking in. You know, I started getting in. Uh, matter of fact, I'll go back because this is when uh, I met daddy from Stetson Sonic. And um, we, used to, we used to battle in the park as well. I mean, you know, um, out in Bushwick. I met Prince Paul. And, you know, I used to love the way he does his thing and stuff like that. And daddy on was just about to get signed to Tommy Boy Records. And I told him I wanted to get into production and stuff. And he was like, yeah, man. He said, if you do, you know, I would manage you. So, you know, it kind of started out that way. And then uh, one day I was just downtown. Um, I had jewelry duty. I saw this sign on lunchtime outside looking for DJs, songwriters, um, um, singers, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and that man came from my man, Steve Standard, Strafe. Strafe, you know, introduced himself and he let me hear some stuff that he had, you know, and he said, let me see what you could do. So I cut and scratch and blah, blah, blah. So I something, you know, and then he played this record. He said, can you do background? I mean, you know, can you do stuff? I said, yeah, you know. So he um he played Set It Off first time when I heard it. And I'm like, okay. You know, so I didn't know what, you know, what it was because it was kind of like really the first, you know, one of the freestyle records back then. Um, thanks to all the PRs that made that record popular, you know. Anyway, um, I asked him, how do you, you know, how do you create this record? He said, I did it by myself. I said, really? He had a, a Foster reel to reel. He had the um the TR16, um, no, the TR606 uh by Roland, I think it was the drum machine or the bass line, and he had the MC micro composer 202 and this uh Moo keyboard and you know, which he created, set it off with. And I said, wow. I said, well, how much does stuff cost? He said, well, you know, he said, look it up, blah, 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 you know. I bought some of the stuff he had. And when I did, I learned how to use it. I started watching these documentaries with Herbie Hancock, who is one of my idols. You know, he used to have this uh, TV show every Sunday. And I would watch this show every Sunday because he would teach you how the MIDI was put together, how to put a track together and stuff like that. So Right, right. That was the, uh, the early internet for us, you know, but it was on TV. You had to wait until Sunday to see it. And, um, you know, from that point on, I stayed in and I learned the craft. I had this uh, this JBZ, JBC box where I used to take, I used to record one track, part of the song. Let's say start with the drums, and then I would take it and switch the tape around and overdub with a bass line switch it around again maybe some vocals and stuff like that so i was doing this till then there the tape had a lot of air in it you started losing uh, resolution to the tape so i was like okay um i started going to other studios at the wild you know the little four track studios and, um you know you know there was some experience you know hanging around there hung around the studios with daddy so how many productions did it take for you to get to the point where the first real, the one that commercially gets released. How many years are you honing this, this, this behind the scenes? Six. I say maybe about a good six years, you know, about six years. Cause that's when um, I was always writing songs. And um, after a while, I think I move, I moved to Connecticut uh, for a little while. Okay. Um, you know, they used to have these little showcases and stuff like that. And I was trying to be a producer out there. But the thing about the people out there at the time, they were just more interested in going to the bars and getting a drink on. And they didn't want to do nothing else, you know. But there was a couple of singers. There was this guy that sounded just like Colonel Abrams. And I wanted to produce him. And then it was this girl that I wanted to produce. So I wrote this song called Turn and Run Away. 
she was supposed to sing it. It was meant for a female to sing. Right. Right. So I'm like, okay, you know, it just never happened. Went to the went back to New York. Ended up, you know, with a job over at the, the Empire State Building working for Helmsley, you know, the Queen of Mean. And um went to this club on a Saturday or something and um called uh Snobbusters. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Oh my god, I forgot about that place. Lower Manhattan, Snobbusters. I met Renato Pearson. He was the DJ there at the time. And um he knew, you know, he knew who I was because you know, I'll go back a little bit because I say Turn and Runaway was my first record. I hate to mention the very, very first record. Let's hear the first, very first, first record. The very first record is called It's Working. And um, it was engineered by Daddy O from Stetson Sonic. I wrote the song. I produced the track. Um, we were all going to the studio called Calliope where Roland Clark first did his first record, All Right. You know, every last one of us was in that studio. Carolyn Harding, um, Public Enemy, you know, every last one of us was going to this particular studio. Where was that studio located? Um, I think 35th Street. Right, in Midtown, almost near Midtown, Midtown right? Manhattan, yeah. You know, all of us was at the studio, you know. What was the draw for you to go to that place? It was Daddio, because they were doing the album in there. You Got know, it. And I liked hanging around and watching the engineers, how they, you know, do stuff, you know, how the engineer watching daddy O, you know, on the mixing board and stuff like that, and how he was just creating. He had like such an energy that he really made me want to be a producer, you know, and, um, you know, it just stemmed from that. So we did this record called It's Working on an independent label called Downtown Records. Same name from the record store that we used to go to in uh, Midtown Manhattan uh, called Downtown Records. And um, I was invited to go to Snobbusters. That's where I met Renato. And um, he said, yo, I got this track I want you to check out one day, you know, come by to, you know, my studio. And he had a nice little setup at his house. Christmas Eve. And I had a cold. You know, it was crazy because if anybody really listened to Turn and Run Away, I got the worst cold. Let me show the, let me show the cover of the record. The damn soul. That's the record he's talking about. Yeah. First official release for Jovan, official. Yeah, official release, you know. And, um, you know, he let me hear the tracks. So I said, okay. Bump it. I was like, let's just change the bass line. Boom, 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 boom. Don't do 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 16 part bass line. So that came off, right? And then I'm singing running, you know, because I'm going run it, no more run it. But it wasn't like that. If I hold my nose, you it's like run it, no more run it. So that's what you heard on the record. I was so stopped up, but he said it works, you know. So it does. It does. that was the hook of the record. So that's all we played. So now I thought about the song that I wrote for the girl and I switched it around to uh, what I'm going to do when our party's through, seeking through the park. My mystery is up the park, looking around the corner. She is headed my way. Got to embrace myself. I just can't get away. I must play it off like I didn't see her thinking about our past. Wishing that it will last, making love we used to make, having caviar we ate, candlelight and wine we toast, love's the way to go. So then I come up with the running, going back to running, 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 you know, so. Ship, 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 dude, I need to let this shit yeah. yeah. So that was another thing, too, by that going on. We needed a, another thing. I said, okay, hold on. So we went back and he let the track go. I said, it needs something. So we went, rewind back. So I was going, shit, do, did it, did it, did do, shit, did do, da, da. So I started doing all of that, which was, you know, every part of the song was shit, do, you know? And there you have it. So one day, uh, Renato came to the house and he said, I got something for you to listen to. So, you know, he 
let the let the, let the uh, cassette play. At the time, we were playing cassettes. There were no CDs. Um, so next thing I know, the song came on. I just thought he did another mix. Then it goes, Tony Humphreys, Kiss FM, blah, 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 you know. And I was like, oh, you know, we we was in the, in the room, like, going nuts. He said, Tony Humphreys played it on the radio, and it's going to be on again, you know, tonight, da, 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 da. And we lost our minds. I called my family. I called anybody I knew. Anybody you knew, anybody you knew, just to anybody. Sure. <laughs> I said, make sure you listen to the radio at midnight. I'm sure it's gonna come on somewhere. I don't know when. I said, but just listen to the show. Just, just lock in. Right. Lock my, in. And my family don't like house music like that. You know, they're like they R and B people. They was like, well, what is this? I said, it's house music. You know. And so when the song, Tony must have played. Maybe it was like the third record that came in, and I'm still making phone calls. Put it on now. Put it on radio. You know, Kiss FM. Kiss hurry FM. Up, hurry up. 98.7 yeah. FM. Hurry up. Put it on. Put it on. Yeah, it was Kiss FM before Hot 97. So, you know, yeah, Kiss FM. You know, so everybody calling up. Oh, wow, that's you singing? I say, yeah. And everybody, I never knew you knew how to sing. So anyway. By, you know, how look, at, look at Jovan back in the day. Look at him. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> so, so behind all of that, um, there was, uh, I guess a deal came in. Warner Brothers was in interested. You know, yeah, that's the early days of Jovan. <laughs> so anyway, I, um, you know, I, I was just like, I felt like a star right then and there from that point on. I was like, wow, this is a start of something. I don't know what's going to happen. So when Warner Brothers decided they wanted to talk to us and they, they made a deal. You know, um, and that was, you know, that was all she wrote, man. We had this damn near look like a Bible contract just to sign through a major label, you know, uh, with the option of an album deal. But, you know, the album deal never happened, you know, but at the end of the day, I had a successful record being the first house artist, I think, on a major label, you know, because, you know, you had Strictly Rhythm, you had all of these other independent labels that was doing stuff. And we had a lot of big records, but I was probably like one of the first independent, I mean, I'm sorry, one of the first art artists on a major label. With this style of music, because this was unheard of back then. Yeah, exactly. You know, the and first that, record yeah. commercially released is not on an independent, but it's on a, you starting with a major company. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, so it was a big deal for me, you know, um, and then, you know, we go to second major label, Love So Special, Sable Jeffries, you know. You know, we did that. Um, un, you know, there's been some misunfortunate about the credit situation, but at the end of the day, people know it's me, you know. And um, that was a very big record still to this day, actually, especially it got big at an R&B club. Yeah, well, the thing is I want to ask is, with the with the turning and running away and the and the excitement of everything that happened in your life changing because now you become a name that people know yeah did everything go right at the end of the record for you yeah yeah i would say did it, do, did it do what you wanted it to do open that door and get you what you needed to be seen in the game I say yes and no at the same time. Reason why I say that because I think the album deal never happened. So that was down sled one. The Atlantic record deal, down sled two, with a successful record, you know. How did that happen? You know, it is what it is at this point, because I don't like talking about it. But at the end of the day, no, but it's gotta be real. Yo, this is true house stories. This is not fake stories. You know, fake well, stories is Fake stories is caviar and champagne dreams, which is right. part of the first part. But right. what's the second part to the? Well, okay. Well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I was just forgotten about as far as the second record, you know, on Sable Jeffries on Not So Special. Um, you know, it was fun creating that track when we were in there. I just happened to come over and I listened to the track, and I was like, "Yeah, okay." 
So, Javon, you got to paint us what was going on. Who invited you where, and why did that happen, and who were the players involved in the, in the Luxor Special Sable game? Well, I just happened to go over. You know, I was just saying, I'm, I'm so sorry. Where? where did you go? Oh, Renato's. I'm sorry. You got to gotta talk. You got to you gotta break down yeah. who's, whose house you went to and yeah. who were all the players yeah. involved in the, in the game. Yeah, I went to Renato's house and I went to this, and, you know, he said, All right, come on through. Sable's over. I said, Oh, okay, cool. So I came through and they already had the track going, you know. And I was just like, you know, she had already did the lead vocals. I was like, Wow. This is dope, you know. Um, he had a sample of Peach Boys going spe special. And I was just like, nah, man, why don't you do it? He said, no, you do it. I was like, nah, you, you kind of sound like that guy. So why don't you sing that part yourself? Sample your vocals and add it in there in the same section. Oh, wow. Okay. And he did it. So he played it again. Listen to that. So I'm sitting there going, okay. He had an M1 uh, core keyboard. So I goes, I said, let me see something. So I'm looking for the sounds and came up with uh, do, 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 Him and Sable was like, oh, shit, yeah. You know, we always like, yeah, this is dope. This is dope. So I'm listening. We're going, listening back at the track again. Right. So I'm singing in my head going, oh, uh, oh, uh. And I said, Sable. I want you to do a, a gave her a note to sing. I sang the, the lower end, let her sing the higher part. <clears throat> so it was just going, oh, doo, 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 oh right? Why he's going special, special, right? So we added that in there as the body foundation of the track. Once we, that, that came in, that was it. That was the record itself, you know? So... We go and took the record over straight to Zanzibar that day. It was a Friday. We went to Zanzibar. And Tony played it. Everybody that knows Bird, you know, Bird, I think people just took what Bird said. Bird, you know, it's like what she says. People just go with it. So she kept yelling out, oh, Renato did it again. I said, no, we did it again. We all did this, you know. Nobody looked at me as a producer. They looked at me as just an artist. I'm assuming. So, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, Renato did it again. And I was just like, no, we all did this. We all did this, you know. So next thing. <laughs> so the music's playing super loud in the club, and you're fighting to get yourself heard. Nobody hears Thank you. you. Yeah, no one's, like, really so trying to hear So that's everybody. The place is going nuts. He's, he's like, yo, but we, we, they're like, yo, Renato did that. And you're like, yeah. no. No. Yeah, I'm saying we. I never said I. You know what I'm saying? I never said that. So I'm sitting there going. Well, it's it's a force majeure, and I'll tell you why. Because he was doing your record. He did the other one, Rodolfo, that hot instrumental too. So Tony's running these records already, if I remember correctly at that time. And the thought is... Yo, Rodolfo came out after. Well, you know what I mean? They, they're just they're talking like at the time, all these records all happening around that time. They're saying, he's, yo, he's the man. They're not, they're not giving you due right because they look at you as a singer, right. not as the producer. I got it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Everybody understand that? He's already pigeonholed as now the singer. Right. So, you know, at that point, you know, when the, the you know, they got to deal with the record. They said, oh, yeah, we got to deal with Atlantic Records. So I'm expecting, okay, great. This is dope. And I think at the time, they used to press record ups real fast, you know. It's like the minute a record is hot, they want to already start getting on it and start, you know, pressing processing and stuff like that. So there was promos, you know. They walking around with the promo. I got a promo, and I'm looking at the credit names, and I'm like, where's my name? I asked Tony Humphreys. He said, I don't want to be involved. That's when that I sounds like him. Tony. That sounds like Tony. It sounds just like Tony was like, I don't want to be involved with that. I, I don't know. You know, that's when I knew things went sideways. And I was probably like one of the most hurt producer, just sitting there off to the side. And I took the record and just smashed it in the corner of the club, you know, and I didn't even want to be bothered. I said, that's it. 
I'm done, you know. And um, I kept asking, you know, calling up, nobody's picking up the phone. And I said, okay, I know what I got to do now. When I thought about quitting, then I said, no, that's okay. Let me let me rewind myself back. I had to, you know, reevaluate myself and said, okay, how do I make the world know who Jovan is? I came up with Go Tone Records. But before I did that, I did an EP called Out All Night EP for Emotive Records. I met David Chang and Josh. You know, I forgot his last name, but anyway. Josh Dorenzi's. Yes, Josh Dorenzi. You know, I met David Chang and Josh. And uh, I gave him this EP, right? Matter of fact, I'm sorry, let me let me bounce back. Before uh, out on that EP, it was Valerie Johnson stepped into my life. So when I did that, I did the hook that shit up, did, 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 and you know, she goes to sing and step into my life. It was a big record, and everyone know who they were starting to know who Joe Bond is. That's when I came up with out on that EP. Flutes, when flutes came out. So then I spoke with them and I said, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about doing my own label. And I did the, I showed them the design, Gold Tone Records. So it was just like, okay. They said, well, you know, let's talk. And, um, you know, we did some of the negotiating and everything and um, Gold Tone came around. You know, Gold Tone was, was the birth of Gold Tone. And uh, the first record that I did was called Be Free on it, on Gold Tone. Um, that record sold very well, man. I think at the time we sold like 30,000 copies, you know, 30, maybe 40 or something like that. But I think it was 30, 35. You can't imagine if a house record at 30,000 copies right now, today, would sell on vinyl, you're going to go gold or platinum. You know what I'm saying? It's unheard of to see a record. But know. back then that was like nothing. Yeah, it was considered a mediocre sale. Right. Remember? You were like, 30,000. Yeah, they was like, oh, you did 30,000. How nice. You know. <laughs> Imagine you did 30,000 physical copies now. That's what I'm saying. To, if that 30,000 was today, man, you might as well sit down. You might be, you know, bigger than black coffee. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that you might. 30,000 records every ain't time. That's the truth. You know, you would be bigger than black coffee, you know, so like, come on, you know, but um, that was the game, you know, be free. I started because so, with... you were angry and yeah. hurt and let down. You said to yourself, I got to do something, make a statement. So you said, let me go make a label. Yeah, I wanted to start a label. Just Did you place. have any uh, anybody? kind of godfather you into it or you just jumped in with no idea what the hell you were even going to do with <laughs> that exactly it was i had no, no idea was no instruction manual Nothing. no not a damn thing man i had no idea what i was doing i didn't have a studio i had a little you know a little setup you know when i did projects i had this little ross mix board an eight channel mixing board with no mute buttons i had uh let me see. The first drum machine was the RY, what was it, the RY30? Yeah, I think it was the RY30 drum machine Casio. A Casio RY30. And um, You sure it was a Yamaha RY30? No, I'm sorry. RY30 was my keyboard. And the drum machine, damn it, I forgot, but it was a, it had four samples on it. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was a Casio keyboard with uh, like a one second sample. So I was taking like a snare, a hi-hat, you know, a hand clap, you know, little cheesy stuff. That's what made a lot of my records sound so raw because I didn't have the real equipment. Is that you why know? everything sounds so raw? Very raw. I had no compressor on any of those records. On any of those gold tone records, there's no compressor except for Be Free, because I recorded that out in Jersey, in Trenton, New Jersey, you know, at a friend studio. And um, that's why it sounds the way it does, you know. Uh, everything else after that, a lot of those records was just, you know, and then I started making a little money. 
I bought a, 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 a 16 channel mixing board, but let me go back to how I made these records. When I did Be Free, I had, I was bringing in stuff like I was DJing. So you had the drums, right? You know, so every little thing I was doing one of these, you know, when I first did the demo and, um, and I had this crazy loud snare on the original and gave it to Tony Humphreys and he put it on the radio every week. He played it every week. And I hated it because I didn't like that loud ass, you know, vibe sounds and everything. And I was like, God damn, man, I must do something about this. But the chords was so dope. It sounded better than when I finished the record, you know? So anyway, went to that studio in, in, in New Jersey and recorded it properly because I said, this has to be right. I'm singing on the record. It has to be right. So Be Free was created, you know, at that studio. And, um, you know, I started doing everything else, you know, on Go Tone, um, raw tracks, no compressor, no, you know, I had a little delay, like a little Yamaha uh, delay unit that I probably paid no more than about a hundred bucks for <laughs> back then. You know, I call it budget, a budget studio, <laughs> you know, but I didn't have a whole hell of a lot going on, man. It was just like, but I made it work for what I had. And that was, to me, that was the best experience I could ever have because you use what you got to be able to, to make a statement, you know, in this business, you know, up until I started growing, you know, a little bit more to, to have a proper studio, you know, studio sound, because, you know, I used to listen to everybody's record on Strictly Rhythm when Kerry Chandler came around, you know, and he started doing stuff because around the same time Kerry came out, Turn and Run Away was hot and Love So Special. So he added this uh, yellow copy, which I still have right over here. The yellow copy of Super Lover, you know, or what was that other one with the record that goes across? <laughs> yeah, they do get it, 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 get it. Yeah. Get it, get it. You know? <laughs> if yeah. I remember correctly, I had him on the show, everybody. Merlin Bob likes, uh, grabbed those records from everybody. Yes, he did. Merlin Bob was the a &R man there. He was yeah. all over you guys in the beginning. Yeah. He was an a &R for um, Love So Special as well, but he didn't know I wasn't part of that record. Of course he know? wouldn't have known because Ronaldo didn't tell me. He, he, Ronaldo said, yo, you like my record? <laughs> yeah. You like my record? Yeah. yeah. All right. You know, because he's already coming off a hot. If I remember correctly now, was it Dave Shaw that did the um, Warner Brothers signing or Cynthia Cherry? Cynthia Cherry. So she's working, yeah. So she, she, signed. Does, she signed it, right? Yeah, she signed um, Turn It Right Away. Okay, so so we know how the game rolls. And AR people talk to AR people, all right? And Cynthia yeah. Cherry was hanging out hard in those days. So she yeah. was probably talking about she just signed that record, Tony's running. Yeah. Like that. That's exactly how she said. Something like that. Tony's running that record. I'm grabbing that thing. I yeah, want she that. She did it. She did it. Almost everything Tony was playing. She was that's, definitely that's how they rolled back then. Tony Humphreys was they I, and, and I and let's get flowers to Humphreys. Yeah. He helped, and I've said it so many times on this show, he helped launch so many people's careers because of that radio show. Yeah, he did, you know, because every last one of us came there with demos. Oh, shucks. You know, all of us line, had, up, line them up, line up everybody from yeah. Chef Pettibone to everybody, Morales, Vega, you, yeah. I don't care who you are. If yeah. you like the record, he ran the record, he ran it to the ground till it got signed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, people used to get mad, you know, like, why is he still playing your record? It ain't out, <laughs> you know, and I'm like. Well, you don't yes. understand. You don't understand why. You'll understand in a moment. Yeah, you'll understand in a minute. You know. Um, uh, also, I mean, you know, during those times, I was a big fan of like the guys, like the Burrell brothers. Like they, they was like these dudes on New Groove Records, like killing it. And 
I was like, man, I want to meet these dudes, you know, and I met them at Zanzibar. I met a diva. I met, oh, wow. There were so many people, Michael Wofford, you know, everybody was on the come up, you know, and, you know, I looked at them as stars when I was the nobody at the time, you know, but then when I started kicking around, that's when people looked at me, hey, Jovan, right? You're, you're, you're Jovan, Jovan. I always get the double Jovan, the one ever says, just plain old Jovan, like, you're Jovan, Jovan, right? I'm like, yeah, I'm him. Yo, man, what's up with that voice? Like, you're five six, but we thought you was like this six ten dude <laughs> with a big vocal. You came I out, of yeah, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, now here's here's the funny part because I had an interview uh, about this particular story about turn. You know, in terms of turning runaway, the record wasn't out yet. It was talked about, you know, getting signed and everything. And um, Colonel Abrams was performing at Zanzibar. So Bird, you know, I call her the troublemaker of house music, if you let her. <laughs> so Bird was like, yo, Jovan, when Colonel finish, I want you to get on and just start singing. And I thought Timmy, I mean, I'm sorry, I thought Tony knew about this information, you know. I, you know, I was like, no, she I just came it. up with it right there and there. Yeah, she's just like, just go up there, you know, when he do your thing. Down, just go up there and do your thing. So Colonel just finished his version of running, you know, running, 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 running. You know, so she was like, oh, she said, Jovan, go. So I went up there on stage. I, and I, she said, when you get up there, right before I got up there, she said, when you get up there, just said, you the real running. No, <laughs> she did not say that. I went on stage like an ass. I hear everybody, I'm Jovan and I'm the real running. And I started singing. Chick do, uh, do, 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 and the crowd erupted. They were like, oh my God, that's him. Nobody knew what I looked like at the time. I was just hanging out. You know what I'm saying? And the place erupted. They were just like, you know, they pointing at me and the women started screaming. The fellas were like, oh, you know, everybody was just losing their minds. And, I was like, damn, I'm like, you know, so Tony Humphreys at the part of the, you know, song, Tony caught up to where I was singing because I sounded exactly like the record. He mixed it in and I thought it was all part of the show. So, you know, I'm still going on and on. And I cut the song short, right? Because I was going, um, um, what I did was a mistake. Leaving you heartache, begging you back for your love. Girl, is you I'm thinking of, right? And I said, thank you. And everybody was like, no, 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 come back, come back. You know, and I'm leaving the stage and stuff. So I'm all happy and shit, not going to booth. I, I said, I said, what you think, Tony? He said, what the fuck was that? What are you doing? You just ruined it. You was my secret weapon for my birthday party. What, what, what were you doing? I don't even want to play it no more. Oh, you're like, I thought I lost everything on the spot, bro. He was like, I don't even want to play it no more. That sounds like him too. Yeah. He said, that's it. I don't, I don't play it no more. You can forget it. Blah, 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 blah. So Renato was like, what was that, man? What are you doing? What did you do? Blah, blah, blah. He said, he ain't even going to play it no more. We probably won't even have a deal with Warner Brothers no more now. No, 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 no. I'm sitting there going. I felt like crap, man. I was just sitting there going, oh, what did I do? Bird was sitting in the corner laughing her ass off, you know, when this was going on. I said, this is your fault. This is your fault. <laughs> you know? She said, I didn't I didn't put a gun to your head. I didn't tell you to do that. I was like, yes, you did. I thought you was, I thought everybody knew what was going on. So I went with the program. Otherwise, I would have been like, nah. Yeah, man. you would have done it. No, you would have not never done it. You would never well, would have done it. there disrespecting Colonel Abrams. You know what I'm saying? That's how I felt. I did. Did Colonel, like, did Colonel get angry at the fact he, that did, he just looked at me from the side of the stage, you know, and he was just going, hmm. You know, because you know and, he's got that voice. Like, hey man, what were you talking about? You're the real runner. Yeah, he didn't say nothing to me. He just wow. looked at me, and I felt bad because I'm, a, you know, I was a big Colonel Abram fan, you know, and speculation. I, 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 I,
Yeah, come on, yeah. that voice would kill everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and it's killing it out there. So I was sitting there going, "Oh man, this is one I could." I went home, and I called Tony. I was like, "I apologize." You know, I I thought he said, "You know, by the time he cooled down, he said you're still going to do the show, but you can't be doing that. You know, you can't just jump on the stage and just belt out." You know, I was just like. You ain't got to worry about that ever again, <laughs> you know? So, but that, that was, that was the crazy part, you know? Oh my God, man. So many crazy moments about Zanzibar. It was just, it's priceless. You know, my first show, I had on these hammer time pants and shit. And um, I, I don't think I fastened it very well. I'm in the middle of performing a song I'm going back and forth from the stage. And, you know, I, I, you know, my pants, I kept, you know, trying to keep the pants from going, but then when I did one of these and my pants just dropped. <laughs> Swear, the most embarrassing thing ever. And I just kept singing, <laughs> you know, putting my pants back on, tying it up, you know, <laughs> still going on cheap dude, they, you know, as long as I still had the attention, but they were just like, oh shit, his pants just fell, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> With the parachute pants, like oh, three sizes God. too big. Was the the pants. Yeah, you know, it was crazy, you know, but um. It was it was it was just some some crazy moments, man. Those are those are the two between Colonel and the the, the pants incident. You know, it was just out of control. So you now at this point you're getting your records out. And of course, people don't understand about contracts, record labels jerking us around, and you know nobody paying proper royalties, and you're fighting everybody to kind of stay alive. Man, that's still going on today. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we know that today, but. You know, you tell us the good points. When was it the point for you that you felt like, ah, I don't know, I don't want to keep doing this anymore? Or, you know, like, what happened? Was there a point in your life where you go, ah, this is just, nah. I think when techno came out, when, when, when techno started getting big and uh, Tribal House, Tribal House and techno was running neck and neck. And I'm sitting there, you know, and I try to come up with still these underground tracks and stuff and giving them something. And they was like, oh, no, this is not for us. So we're not accepting this. So we're not, you know, we're not trying to add that. And at the time, you know, I was like, you know what? There's no point in me trying to press up any records because they're not trying to hear me. You know, I felt like I took a two year, you know, hiatus at the while. You know, I wasn't making no records. I pretty much went back to focusing on hip hop and doing uh, R&B production, hip hop production, the remix with uh, Jill Scott, uh, remix for um, a few artists on, on major labels because I used to go up to uh, East West Records. Freddie, Freddie was one of the A&R guys at, uh, Freddie Sanders from Shelter was one of the A&R guys there as well as uh, Merlin Bob and um, Jerome Sinahan. You know, these guys were working over there. So I was always going up to the office and I had these little R&B records and stuff. And it wasn't up there, you know, up there alley and stuff like that. I came back. <clears throat> when I did come back, you know, I started Next Move Records. When I, uh, the first Next Move record was, um, shit. I think it was um, current. I think it's called Current Movie EP. Anyway, I did another record before that, and it was supposed to be this record called uh, "Can't Get Enough." Gave it to Tony Humphreys. Tony Humphreys talked me into it tooth and nail. Like, yo, I, this is for Yellow Orange. This is for my label. You really need to give me this record. I need this record. Thank you. I was like, come on, Tony. I need something. I ain't been out in two years. Can I just put this out? And he was just like, I'm not giving up. So I ended up, you know, signing the track to him. And I started another, you know, another EP, you know, current movie EP. And um, 
it did okay, you know, for the first time. And then I kept going. So I started producing a lot of uh, records between Next Move and Next Move tracks. So tracky stuff. Got I think like, you just name that. And then. Ah, uh, that's it. Next Move tracks. There you go. Right. Next Move tracks was the entity, you know, imprint of Next Move Records. Uh, Next Move Records was like mostly vocal stuff, you know, because I worked with Carolyn Harding. Yeah, Pitch Black, which, which was uh, Black Back in the Dark. And um, a lot of people don't even know that it came from my label first before uh, Distant. Remember Distant Records, right? Out in London. And I used to get them mixed up with Defected, <laughs> you know, for some reason, because the logo kind of looked the same. And um, Distant took the record and licensed it, right? Me and DJ D uh, recorded that song um, in uh, 1999, you know, and I started, you know, just talking about what's going on, you know, you know, what uh, doing back in the dark, you know, we did these tracks because I was in Paris doing a gig with him. And, um, you know, the next day we decided to go in the studio and do this collaboration. So when that EP, Pitch Black, came out, mm -hmm. it's a bus because I haven't heard nothing for like two months, nothing. And out of nowhere, somebody, I don't know who broke it, who broke the record in, but it was being played everywhere. You know, and I started going to club. They was like, you did this record and you're talking and you're going something about back in the dark and you know, and I said, are you serious? You know, so it was a couple of DJs. And the more and more, as the weeks went along, the record started charting and it started selling. And, oh, man, it did real well with that, man. You know, it was just such a... So coming off of the two-year hiatus and then having that must have felt really good. It did. It when did. does the first international DJ gig that gets you becoming the DJ Jovan, the world traveler? Well, I was hanging out. I was going to uh, dance tracks records in Lower Manhattan and, and uh, where everybody internationally come to New York always shop that dance tracks records. And I met DJ Deep there, you know, and he was asking, you know, your Jovan, I said, yes, you know, he said, bro, I love your music, you know, and I got this club residency um, and, uh, you know, he was like, it's called the Rex Club. So I said, oh, okay. You know, he said, would you be interested in coming to Paris? I said, yeah, you know, so. No. <laughs> no <laughs> right? No, yeah, I want right? to go nowhere. I want to stay right here in New York. Exactly. You know, so I was the person. And it was my first time flying, you know. Oh, you never flew anywhere ever? I flew nowhere. Okay. Nowhere. So you never left New York, New Jersey? No. Wow. I never toyed when I had when I was on Warner Brothers because I didn't have a manager. I had nobody. Everything that was pretty much ever done, I did it myself. You know what I'm saying? And gigs, people still didn't even know Jovan was a DJ. But DJ D took a risk. Not really knowing. And I think what happened was I used to make tapes when we used to go to WMC in Miami. And I was giving out tapes just so people can hear me mix, you know. And I wasn't really looking to play anywhere no, internationally. I just wanted people to hear my mixing talent. So DJ D, you know, when he got me, I ended up playing with him at Rex Club. And we vibed, man. And we had such an amazing time that I was always coming out to Paris. Then I started going to Italy and stuff like that, you know, Maurizio Clemente. Um, I was doing Milan, Naples. Let me show some pictures. You know, look at Jovan, his glory. I was, I was doing some serious, um, you know, big gigs. You know, not really realizing where I'm at and what I'm doing. You know, it was just madness, man. I mean, you know how I would embrace the crowd. It was just like, yo, just to see people, you know, go crazy off for something that I created. It's like was it's the greatest reward I could have you know received, you know, because it's like the birth of a record. It's like, man, this is this is amazing, you know. Um, you get to play for that beautiful crowd. Yeah, I started doing London. First time I, you know, I did London. It was with, um, you know, 
few people, you know, um, that I, I worked with. And, you know, Maurizio brought me out there, you know, out to London. And it was, you know, I used to record records over there. And, and in Italy is where I did, uh, I first produced uh, Garage Shelter. You know, when I did Garage Shelter, that was like, if you really listen to that whole EP, that was like <laughs> raw. If you ever heard raw records, that was like the raw EP, you know, because the bass line is super mighty and the kick and that big bass line out of nowhere. And it was just like, ah, uh, you know, I really wish I could do this record over. But it worked for what it, it did at the time. I think that's what makes you you. You didn't care. You yep. just want to get records out. You didn't yep. care, right? Yeah. I wasn't trying to make a hit record. I was just trying to do good music. Um, at the time, I still didn't even know what the hell I wanted to do. You know, I was just trying to find my niche. What is going to be Joe Vaughn's sound? I didn't even know I had a sound until people used to go, we know your records. Like the minute the first few bars are your, you know, drums or your bass line or your chords, we know it's you. And I was just like, really? You know, and they called my music underground. I said, all right, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. And I, you know, I just accept it. Let's give Mr. Trouble Anderson a big praise like Mr. Humphreys on the on the UK side, because I remember he used to rock your, your jams hard to his KISS fans and also his party at the Loft. Yeah. I had the privilege of, to play with Paul Trouble Anderson. Really amazing brother, you know, very pleasant. And he was like such a huge fan. And he was like, I can't believe that we're playing on the same set, Jovan. Like, yo, this is, this is history for myself. That's the way he was just saying. And, you know, I've always heard his name and I saw him play in Miami and stuff like that. And I was like, this dude plays some, he plays some tracks, some really good stuff. Yeah, good, great DJ. Um, I'm going to bring up something that's going to be a little sore for Jovan. He's going to remember this. So I think we were hanging out at the, the law many, many, many decades ago in London. And Jovan had just came from the studio and he had on a leather jacket. <laughs> and he made a big mistake. Yeah. He put the jacket down. Yep. And in that jacket was a wad of pounds, if I remember. Yep. And Jovan turns to you says, You believe this? Yeah. They took my shit. Yeah. I was like, I lost it. What I happened? What are you talking about? He's like, I laid my jacket down. These people took my shit. It was, yeah. It was my first time in London. I remember that now. You know, when we were together, you, you were right next to me. He was like, yeah. you, know, you were like, I, I didn't even know you laid the jacket down because I would have been watching it. Yeah. It was on the stage. That's the problem. We were hanging out behind Trouble's booth on the stage. Right. You know, he played before me. I went on. And then after I did the set, because I closed it out. And I go to for my jacket, and my jacket is gone. And it, after, you know, it it bothered me about the leather jacket, but it was all my money that was in it that I made from that gig. Gone. I was so livid, man. So pissed off. And yeah, I remember when you was like, "Calm down, Joe Vaughn," because you was trying to calm me down. I was trying to keep the peace there. I'm like, "Yo," I said, "I don't want the cops to come and arrest us." I said, "You," because he was getting crazy. Like, oh. I don't want to repeat how we said it, but you know, <laughs> he went, he went I, Brooklyn, Brooklyn hard. I ended up saying, yeah, I ended up saying some really racist stuff about. Woo, racist. I was like. Yeah, about our people because it was a black club. And I really was like, I don't, one thing I did say, I said, I've played at anywhere in the world, Milan, Paris, anywhere, and I put my jacket down. Nothing happens. I go to a black club and y'all motherfuckers want to steal shit. That's it. And I said, Jovan, stop. He's like, no, man. F them. Yeah. F these mother. Yeah. I'm like, I was going in. I was going in. 
you know, I am. This is real. This is right. Talk about people, how we were all in the trenches when stuff was really, you know, people asking, was I really around? Yeah. I saw it. I was right there. Yeah. You, you, you calmed me down, but that whole night I couldn't sleep. I, oh, I don't blame you. I think it was about 1,500 pounds you had in your jacket. I remember you screaming. Uh, Something like that. Something like that. I remember it was a lot of money. 20, yeah, 2,500. 20, I don't remember. Something like 15, like 2,000. You're like, yo, that's all my money in there. Yeah. I was yeah. like, um, then my next question was to Jovan, what the hell would you leave in the jacket? Well, it was winter time, man. It was cold in London. No, you know? no, no, no. No, you had jeans. You should have put them in the in the put that money always in that. Oh, put the money. Well, you know, because I think the pocket was short that I had on, so I didn't want the money falling out. I probably would have been mad more about that. I was like, damn, I dropped my money, I messed up. But I put it in a coat with the zipper, so I'm thinking I'm good, you know. And you know, some somebody... people are writing, Jovan, welcome to North London. Uh, <laughs> where the hands are yo puppy the hands are sticky where the glue the glue is tight right you people yes. you know you people think we're stupid like we're like we're you know, in zanzibar or in the paradise garage you if you had that kind of coins and you wouldn't let you you would never pick them out of your you would never take your jacket no, i never did that right, right? you never take your jacket you never would take your jacket you'd be like oh i take my jacket off Cause you know, um, you knew, you knew in Newark, where you're gonna make it out of there at night. Forget about even putting yeah, the jacket down. Exactly. You know, I, I would have thought, in, um, you know, since I traveled around the world, you know, I'm thinking it's the same thing in London, you know, but it was a big mistake. Good people. Yeah, good people. Love. Yeah. Oh, they got a lot of love for you. They, 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 they still love, love, but they got more. Somebody got more than the love and. Hey, that person might be still alive right now. Going, yeah, I was the one that did that. I yeah, come forward. That. Yo, come forward and admit it to Jovan. Come and you know, bring that money back to him. Bring him what he needs. You know, he's probably like 75 when it came. Yeah, I was that dude back then, man. You know, and could you imagine? The person that took my coat didn't realize that there was money in it. You know what I'm saying? Well, he Milton said it was me. Milton well, said it was me. It was and me. He, <laughs> yeah, he probably went into the jacket and was like, "Oh, I know, I can't go back to that club now." Wait a minute, let me let me let me refresh my memory. I think you even got more upset when you turned to me and said, "My passport's in there too." Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Oh man, I didn't even know how I was going to get home. That's what happened. You said, "Letty, I, the money's one thing. I don't have my passport." I went. Everything was gone, gone, you know, I mean, but I was able to get home because uh, I explained it to the American embassy, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so I had to get a passport right away as soon as I came back to New York, you know, but it was, it was just such a crazy experience, man. But um, that's what, that's what I'm trying to tell everybody. See, you live and learn. <laughs> you live and learn. These are hard. These are hard learns. These are learns that we don't want to learn, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So were you out there at the time when you were starting to get some play to try to become the remixer or were you just thinking about strength to strength, making records? I would say strength to strength, just making records. But then, yeah, I wanted to tamper with remixes because my first remix that I've ever done was with uh, Sabrina Pope, Holding On. It was me, Masters at Work, and um, I think Wu to Swing. All of us was a part of this project. And um, I think it was like a three-pack record or something like that. You know? Right. But everybody had a mix on the vinyl. And it was crazy, but it was my first, my first remix ever, you know. And How'd you approach that, Jovan? Well, what, were you, what were you thinking about, like at the time, you know, because you know you had a sound. It was raw. It was it was street. It was you. It was like like people would say in 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 Zanzibar, you the Jovan the Jovan like that. Yeah. So that Jovan had a Jovan sound. I had a Jovan sound. Um, I, I went to another studio when I did the remix on that because I didn't know how to take the vocals and put it to the track at the time. You know, 
I didn't know. So Fair I went, you know, to another studio and we recorded it and everything. So I was like, oh, okay, because they used to come with. Um, I show you perfect example. It's gonna go into the archives. It shows the example, everyone. That's what I love about this show. For the, for those for those that don't know time code that used to go on recordings, <laughs> we used to run it through this. We used to run it through a DAT, right? Time code, you take the, the, the vocals and put it on one side and the time code on the other side separated, but the, the whole song is still in mono, you know, you, you record it. But we used to record with this, you know, everybody, you know, all our masters, you know, whether you did a mastering track or, you know, you sent this out for remixing up until CDs came around, you know, right. that, that was, that was it, man. You know, but it was, once I got the taste of remixing the record, I think it was just such a challenge to take something from somebody else's project and, and turn it into your own groove. You know, I didn't give it the raw edge on the Sabrina Pope record. I, I did like a lot of piano, very musical, you know, because I knew Louis Vega and them was going to be on it. I said, I can't give him a raw record. I need to be able to compete the same feel, you know. I didn't want to come up with, you know, even though I was cursed out about it. It was like, oh, what happened to the Joe Von Ross sound? To this day, even if I remix somebody's record, the first thing I want to say, could we get the old Joe Von sound? I'm like, yeah, but that was like 30 plus years ago. That's like trying to say Motown should come back. Come on. You know, I'm not trying to do that. Like, yo, you know, I want to move That's the forward. problem. That's the problem. Everybody's got you pigeonholed. Yeah. Everybody's got you locked in a box. Yeah, they don't want you to come out of that box. Right. And you've already gone past that because of times, change, equipment. <clears throat> yeah. Now what? Now what do you do? Well, you know, you've got to be able to stay in the game along with the, the, the new, you know, the youngsters, the new producers of today. you got to be able to compete what they do, you know. Um, but what they need to do is compete with us but because – they got to be able to keep up to how we create a record as producers because we know how to make a drum track, you know, from the from the ground up. Yeah. We know how to do our own chords, you know. We know how to do bass lines, whether if it's live or on the keyboards, you know. Um, we know how to sing, <laughs> you know. We, we know sometimes we don't need nobody to come in. We could do it ourselves. I'm more self-sufficient. I'm probably one of the... The last of the Mohicans are self-sufficient because you're the band of box, bro. I you're everything, know. right? You're the you everything. Know. You're the background singer, the front lead singer, the yeah. arranger, the composer, the writer, yeah. producer, well, mixer, engineer, mastering aficionado, I'm and a record label executive. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm yeah. saying record label executive and all. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, man. You know, but you know, it's I I enjoy what I do as a producer. I love turning sounds. I love changing sounds. Like I used to take the mechanisms of the keyboards and people used to ask me, how do you get come up with that sound for uh, B3? Or how do you come up with that sound for, um, you know, any particular record that I did, I used to always change the diagnostics of those old rec those keyboards, you know? So, so on, a, on another note, two questions I'm going to ask. When you get a major label remix, do you approach it the same way? That's one question. And the second part is, are there any current people that you're amusing? Meaning, are you looking to to get inspiration from? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Everybody got that answer. Okay, we'll leave that one there. The, the major yeah. label remix. Um. Label, major label remix. Um, how would I come at them? Yeah, because you said, man, Martin, notice how you mentioned about Sabrina Pope, you know, with Louis Vega and all them on the. Yeah, I want to be able to come up, you know, not too commercial, but still give that 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 Jovan vibe. I want to put it together, you know. I don't want to give the straight raw unless the the, the 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 label itself asks me. I go, well, you know what? I'll do two. I'll give you what you ask for, but I want to do the other thing, and I'm going to give you, you know, something that's going to compete with 
a festival, you know, a festival where you, you get to hear it at a festival or you hear it at a major club or possible radio, you know, radio play. I want to be able to do that to compete with all of those records that's being played on the radio. They're not going to play nothing raw on the, on the radio, you know. It's just not going to happen. You're only going to hear it in the clubs or a mix show. That's that's as far as it goes, you know, unfortunately. But for a young cat starting out now, what kind of advice do you give them? You know, because where you were and where in decades later where you are now, what do you tell somebody who says, hey, Jovan, what's the secret to getting into this game now and making it? I say the, 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 the secret is to be able to produce a track and have your own, <clears throat> excuse me, have your own sound. You know, as long as you've got your own sound, you're, you're more recognizable. Like I got a guy, good friends with, you know, his, his name is Ben Rebel. And, you know, we talk about, he's like, Jovan, how do people, uh, you know, how is anybody going to recognize my music? I said, just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to stand out. You know, um, you, you just got to keep pushing because I had to do the same thing. As anything anybody doing right now today is trying to be recognized for their style of music, you just have to keep pushing your sound in order to make it. But you got to be able to compete with the next records that's out there. You know, if you're a DJ, it's easier to figure it out because you're playing different music all the time. Or if you go out, if you're not a DJ, listen to these records and see what's hot. See who's, who stands out and who has a longevity in the music game and follow that person and figure it out. You're going to come up with your own sound. You know, you, you know, just try not to learn how to make your own tracks. You know, I, I, I know I crack jokes about the drag and drop producers and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of us get in that kind of conversation, but it makes sense to be able to create your own drum track, your own bass line, your own chords and stuff like that. Um, like Cracker Zack. That dude, he does what we do. And he's he's new on the block. But Cracker Zack is like one of the dopest producers. I, I like what he does. I yeah. like what he does. I, I'll actually say I get inspiration from him. It's funky. Yeah. That's what I like about it. It's got a funk edge to it. It's not just house. It's got a funky sound. Yeah, he does have a funky sound. Cracker Zack is like, you know, crazy, you know, crazy, you know, Mark Contre Contrell. He's like, he's like, he's like a, a modern Kerry. There you go. Modern yeah. Kerry Chan, like a modern yeah. Kerry. Like when we met Kerry back when he was 18, 19. Now it's like, this is the modern Kerry version now. There you go. Exactly. Right? Would you agree, Jovan? I think. I agree that 100%. Yeah. You know. Yo, um, who's, so who's the cat's? emulating Jovan that you hear you're like oh man a lot of them <laughs> it's a lot of them um you know and it's uh that's the thing now they're going back to all our old records and they're emulating them and I'm like oh wow it sounds like us yeah yeah you know I mean I see people really studying like DJ Cinti Cinti you know, she has these little clips of her in the studio creating tracks, and she got all of these keyboards and all of these drum machines that we used to run with. And she has all the official drum machines, and she's creating her own tracks. She's not dragging and dropping and nothing like that, you know. She does her own chords and stuff like that, you know. And there's not too many producers, I can honestly say, who's doing that, you know. Well, Ableton... And Logic have made it so easy, reason, just to drag in someone's loops, drag in the roads part, drag in the bass line. You don't have to know how to, all you have to do is kind of have a good ear and have some sort of feel and you can make something from nothing. Right. Where back in the day, in order to get that drag and drop mentality, you had to make the actual loop. <laughs> yeah. From scratch. You know, people are like, what do you mean? And say, yeah, like, you know, you start with the boom, boom, boom and the hi hat and, yeah. and, and and get it right. That's the first foundation. An hour or two, you're working just on maybe a couple hours just on drums. What do you mean? Yeah. No, takes you two seconds. You're listening to a hundred thousand loops, and you pick one, you go like this. It's like, yo, that band in a box, you're done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I spend 
quite a few times, you know, especially looking for the proper hi-hat. You know, I, I go And for, why? Why do you do that, Jovan? Why? It, it's because you don't want it to sound like your last record. That's one. Number two, I would say... Uh, but isn't formula good, in a sense? Formula? Yeah, no. It is, because, yeah, it's a formula because it's like it's like cooking. You know, you put in ingredients into your, your food. So it's an ingredients to your track where this every hi-hat to another producer might say, oh, but they all sound the same. No, it doesn't. Because you got your... Then you got the... Or... You know, or even a close hi-hat from... You know, or you know, is I spend like damn near, you know, once in a while, like a, a freaking half an hour looking for the perfect clothes hi hat. And why? And because nowadays, people say it don't matter no more. It really matters because it brings the record out and it sounds better. You, like you know, this yeah, record. because a hundred thousand records being released. Yeah, the day you heard this too. Come on, I'm telling you what's being told to me. I'm just hitting it the same way. I'm going, yeah, but it, it makes all the difference, right? Come on, tell them, Jovan. It really does. It makes a big difference, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, man, you could tell a, a producer put his heart into a track. You know, a lot of these producers, you could tell them they make a record. You can't feel the emotions on the record. It's like it's just a record. So you got that da, do, do, da, da, do, do, where if I did that record, they're gonna jump on I want you to remix this record. You're gonna hear da, do, 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 ka, da, do, do, do. you know, you can feel it. So it's like you sitting there going, wait a minute. He did the same thing I did, but you can actually feel what he's doing because all I did was emulate what you did, but I I give it my identity, number one. Number two, I give it more of a, a, a feel because you're putting your feelings into it. It's just not a, a model feel where you're just like, yeah, this is dope. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. Now, I mean, let's get this bass line. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we got a record. Here we go. You know, let's do this. I sit there and go, nah, man, you know, you want that. You know, you want that where you sitting there constantly damn near breaking your neck listening to this track that you're coming up with. And it has a feel, you know, it's a feeling. Everything that you do is like going out there trying to sing. You know, you can sing like you at karaoke or you singing like you made the damn record. It's like, yo, this person's really feeling that their song, you know? So it's the same thing as into making a record, as to being a singer, you can feel when somebody's belting out something that they, you know, they produce or or they doing, uh, uh, you know, singing someone else's song, a cover song, put it that way. But I'm gonna tell you own. something. I'm gonna tell you something somebody else said on an interview when I asked this particular question about, you know, the new school versus the old school. They said, and his name is Mr. Simon Dunmore, who is the owner. He's no longer the owner of Defected Records. He's the creator of Defected said. That's my boy. Yeah. Yes. Simon Dunmore has helped launch a hell of a lot of people's careers and helped a lot of people. Mm. I'll say this for him. I'll repeat what he said and see where you're at with this. What may produces then and what makes them now, I'm going to just paraphrase because it's not exactly the same is stay in your lane. Don't try to be Somebody David else. Morales. Don't <clears throat> try to be Jamie Jones. Don't yeah. try to be Lenny Fontana or Brian Tabber from Sulfuric or Jovan or Kerry Chandler. Yeah. Do something different. There you go. That's why you stood out, Jovan, because you came with hate and love. I hate all of you for what you did to me, but I'm going to throw you some major love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it. it's That's pretty much it, right? Because I remember you saying me. I would like to say it the way Jovan said it to me. And please, no, anyone take this as me saying racially charged, but I'm going to say it just like he said. Yo, I'm tired of these niggas taking my shit. Yeah. This is that he told me on the side, just like that. Yeah. These mofos think they're cute with their shit. Take my shit and then all of a sudden turn it and then take it like it's theirs. 
They did. Uh, when yeah. Jovan, I remember Javon saying, he says, what do you think about it? I went, isn't that a cool house? <laughs> cool house? <laughs> no, is that what everybody doing sampling shit? But that's the way, unfortunately, I, I understand Dunmore's position. I understand Jovan's position. I understand Dave Morales' position. I understand I had Robert Cavillis on CC Music Factory, and I remember what they were doing. They were sampling some of the best records and making things come fresh and new from, like, taking amazing artwork and making a kaleidoscope, and then you have a brand new piece of artwork. It's like, wow! But yet, it's the Mona Lisa in there, the Brooklyn Bridge, you know. The music is like that. Music has, oh, maybe I can hear that little sample from this guy. Yeah, yeah. And this sample from that guy, and sometimes it works. And sometimes it don't work. Right. Yeah. True. Javon, looking forward, because you're still young, you're still young in life. Yeah. Where do you see yourself to the end of this? Where do you see? Where do? You, what would you like to see for yourself? You know, in the epitaph, when it's, when you retire or it's done, what do you think is? You know. Um, I want to see the next. Uh, I want to see the next Jovan, future Jovan. You know, I want to be able to leave a legacy to the next generation that can actually do a record like I do, but better than me. You know, um, I'm already mentoring a, a producer, um, young producer at that. He just turned 14, named Max Jack, and I want people to look out for this kid because he's going to be dangerous. Is that the white boy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me he's find British. his picture. I think I got a picture you sent me. Yeah, he's British. Um, he's uh, an amazing producer, man. How I found him was just ridiculous because, you know, he couldn't believe that I made a phone call to him. Is know? this him? I don't see it yet. It should be coming up. Is that him or not? Yeah, that's him. Hey, how old is he? He's he, at the time. That's thirteen. He's fourteen now. Wow! Wait a minute. So, how did you find him? He did a he did a this video clip on Instagram, and um, it was this track that he did called "Don't," and um, I seen everybody commenting on it. Right, Tommy Bones, and you know, I said, "Oh wow, Tommy's on this dude." You know, so I'm looking at it. And I'm playing this, I must have played this video like five times. And Max was with this kid, you know, his cousin. But, you know, I thought they was partners. He said, like, oh, you know, this my track and I, you know, I want to see what you think about it. And then um, here it goes. Da, 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 do, do, da, da, da. It had these choppy chords. And then the drums kicked in. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like. This is dope. So I'm sitting there like, no, 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 no. Listen, let me let me play it again. And I'm listening and trying to hear him. I said, nah, these dudes, these are kids. They probably playing their father's track or something. I said, I'm playing him. <laughs> this is father's track. Get out of here, you know. So I said, let me try something. So I wrote to him. I said, this is dope. Did you do this track? And he said, yes. So I, I said, did. Bump. Right. So I said, bump it. So I called him on Instagram. And he said, yes, I said, this is Jovan that just spoke with you. And um, we need to talk. <laughs> you know? I said, where's your dad? You know, so his dad gets on the phone. And, you know, I spoke with him. He said, I said, where does he learn this? He said, he just one day just picked up. I said, most kids his age, you know, at the time he was 12. Matter of fact, he was 12 years old. And... I said, most kids his age, they just playing video games. They PlayStation, you know. PS4, you know, PS5. Yeah, PS4, PS4 whatever the hell they doing. Yeah, video game kids. You know, he's not a game head. I said, but this kid listening to tracks, he's DJing, and he, and he makes tracks. I said, this is ridiculous, you know. And I said, um, you got any more tracks like that? He said, yeah, sure. So he sent me. 12 tracks, you know, and I'm listening to him. I said, okay, okay, you know, so I said, that's it. I said, listen, man, I want to sign you to Body ND. Let and me show the BND logo. Let me show the yeah. logo. 
I said, I want to sign you to Body and Deep. I said, wow. We need to talk, you know. So his father was like, you really want to sign him? I said, yes. First of all, wait, Jovan, did the father know who you were? No. He I don't really know if the father's even into dance music or anything. Does he know anything about this? He, you know, they listen to house, but not really like that. But I think when his son got more into what he does, and then, you know, they heard house music, of course. I said, you don't DJ? He said, no, my son does all of that. I was like, this is amazing. I said, this is, I said, I need to take him on and show him the ropes, how to be a producer, how to, you know, put his stuff in the, in the right places, arranging, you know, like bars and drum chats, because a lot of his tracks starts off with just sounds. But they didn't really start off with drums. Oh, they're not DJ oriented. They're more just just, just tracks. tracks, like a track, just like right. a, just do it yeah. together. Got yeah. it. Yeah, they're just tracks. So I'm sitting there going, I, I'm going to guide this. So I spoke with my manager about it, Mark Potts. I said, Listen, man, you got to hear this kid, and I want to sign him to, you know, my label, Body and Deep. You know, so he was just like, so I sent it to him. He said, No way. I said, he's 13. You know, I mean, at the time, I said, he's 12. So, you know, I started playing his tracks on a radio show and just to see what kind of response. So everybody was just like, wow, yo. I said, Max, okay, I need you to do a four-track EP. <laughs> <laughs> I started to laugh the way you said it, too. Now I need you. you better, you're, not, you're not going to school today. You're going to yeah. sing home. You're going to be a track. <laughs> I said, I need you to do a four-track EP, right? Oh, my God. And I'm going to help you with one of those tracks, you know? That's great. Um, oh, my God. Wait. Track for strings. Wait, he's calling this kid. Look at how look how cute this kid is. What's his name? Max? Max what? Max Jack. Max Jack. J -A -Jack. So he's like, hey, mate, how are you? And yeah. you're like, I need four tracks from you, like, pronto. Yeah, but but check it out. You see how that picture is on there, right? I thought he was short. When he stood up, the kid is six, like six feet, man. Really? I thought, I thought he was gonna be like a little, like a little no, short. No, he's six feet, man. Like, yo, I think he like damn near six two now. He's fourteen. He he just recently turned fourteen. Yo, he's not a little kid. He's yo, man. He did this this gig. Uh, uh, maybe two weeks ago or a week ago, and he just looked like a straight up rock star. It was like girls crying in the in the crowd, like you know, like he where did we go wrong, Jovan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, you where know, did we go wrong because it, it, like like <laughs> it was not like that. It was not like that back then. It was not like that back no, then. You had to work your ass off for when we started making records. You had to be, it was the A&R who would judge everything you do. You know, it was hard for us to make a record. You don't get luck like Max. You know? No, no. You he wasn't even got a second look, no first look in that in those days. They would have been like. They would have just said, you too young. Right. Yeah, yeah right. You're too young. You're too young to make a record. That's it. You know, it, it, we didn't have to cut our losses till we got older. Now your voice changed if you're a singer. Well, you don't sound like, you know, back in the day when you, you sound like the young it. Michael. Now he's like the yeah, old. You don't sound like Michael. <laughs> 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 you know, but Max is he's he's that that future star. You know, I see it. I, I see the look in his eyes. I, I hear it in his work. Um, he has a new EP coming out called Who Is Max coming out. He does have a single that's out right now on Body of Deep called Extensions of House and um, uh, Extensions of House Music. Um, but his EP is coming out on vinyl. So we wanted to open up digitally with uh, just one of the tracks. So he has a four track EP coming out on vinyl for those that, you know, got they ears peeled open, so I'm promoting, you know, making sure that people is aware of him. And I want to make sure that he gets to be a household name, you know, and he's getting there. It's going to take a little time. You know, magic don't happen overnight, you know. And, and in this game, it's not like the EDM where you could do one track and it just explosion. It takes, there's a, there's a building block process that you got to get through. Yeah. You got to work, you got to work 
you know, it's it's strategic work, but it takes patience, virtue, and passion. Absolutely. You know, if anybody knows that, I know you know that. You, you know, in fact, when I go to the in, in the encyclopedia, it's a J for Jovan. Those are three words: passion, virtue, and patience. Is definitely in there next to your picture. Exactly. Exactly. So you're teaching this youngin, young buck, as we would say. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. virtues, so that he can become a really big, successful producer DJ very soon. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think that you know when he's, uh, you know, he has his favorites. He's like um, a lot of the producers that he listened to, you know, that he, he you know, he favors. Um, I'm one of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he listens to a lot of, you know, I told him, listen to everybody, mostly listen to the 90s house producers, you know, because those records will school you more than the records today. To, to me, today's records just uh, one dimension. They don't go nowhere, you know. A lot of these records that came out in the past five, ten years, maybe, won't be really won't be classics. You know, whatever he comes out with, I want his record to stand the test of times, like my records. Um, I don't. I never thought my records would be anything of standing the test of time because of they were so raw. You know, with Go Tone, Go Tone, all of those records was just like, damn. You know, I didn't, I couldn't believe how it was being is being embraced to this day. You know, um, people are playing it like it just came out. You know, and and that's a good thing at the same time because uh, <clears throat> rather they're they're new producers or DJs, they being schooled on how house was first started. You know, we're from the beginning of the days of Boy Jarvis. You know to Nick Stryker Band, all of those Prelude records, Fr Francois Kevorkian. You know, I learned a lot by listening to a lot of Francois Kevorkian as an engineer producer because I like how he separate his records. I would listen and have the headphones on and you hear stuff coming out of the left and then something coming out of the right and then it's right in the center. I'm like, damn, that's dope, you know? and. It, would, it just made me really realize what it takes to be an engineer and a producer because you got to be able to have somebody go, damn, I heard this record before, but I didn't know that little sound jumping out of nowhere and then something coming off to the left and then something right, you know, right in the center or something like that. So it, 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 it's uh, it's crazy, you know. Francois Kevorkian is just one of those Killer producers, man. I give him major, major respect. You a, can't take it away from him. He did things that nobody else was doing at that time. Right. Different he, dubby sounding. And, and that's Francois, the mad scientist. That's just yeah. how I always said about his mixes. Yeah. They just they just got something so different about them. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, and, you know, judging from my, my favorites, you know, if you want to go there, you know, my favorite producer. It's Kerry Chandler, of course, because we're like brothers. I mean, let me show the picture of all the family together. Look at this. Merlin Bob, Kerry Chandler, and right there, Jovan. It's all together. Yeah. You know, that's 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 us, man. You know, we forget about it. Me and Kerry, we're like the, mass, the last of the Mohicans of the real underground, you know? Um, and then go Dennis Ferrer. Dennis Ferrer is like, uh, I, I call him more like a poetic producer. Like he, this guy, brain just come out of nowhere. You know, anybody that knows Dennis Ferrer's sound, you know, he came to the to the fact of doing a lot of the uh, arranging. His arrangements is is, is sick you know from his soulful house and then he started doing tech house and deep house when he did hey hey that was all she wrote <laughs> you know hey hey was like i was the first one he called when it went gold you know i thought somebody died he said yo man i can't yo yo i said slow down what are you talking about hey hey just went gold i said yo i said congratulations i was like you know 
that's that's a that's big for him, you know, because he ain't the only one that went gold on certain records, you know, like Kenny Dope with these things fall into my mind, you know, that that sample record on Henry Street, didn't that go um, gold, right? Oh yeah, there's yeah. Kenny Dope. There he is from, from half of Headmaster's work. Yeah, you know when he did that. These things fall into my these like, sounds of uh, bucket heads. Oh yeah, bucket heads. Yeah, that's what it was. I was like, that went go. Are you serious? <laughs> right. But it was such a huge record because it sounds European to uh, uh, versus New York sound. So you know, again, you know, when it comes to listening to certain producers like Kerry, Dennis Ferrer, Masters at Work. Those are the guys I really listen to for the most part. Um, inspiration, you know, as inspiration, and also Boy Jarvis. When Boy Jarvis on the, on the um, pro, uh, what was it? Oh my God! Um, it was a, a, a purple label, but Boy Jarvis also did the um, the Prelude records. You know, visual music's got me. All those records, yeah. Yeah, when he did those records, it was I was like so into his his bass line, you know, very fancy, you know, his chords, but it was more his bass line and his solos was was bananas, you know. But you know, I take all of that in and develop Joe Vaughn because I had to come up with my own sound and didn't know I had my own sound because I just, you know, I come from hip hop and listening to a lot of jazz and hip hop that's where all my my you know swing drums come from just listening to hip hop or even chords you know come from uh traditional jazz music or neo soul i'm a big neo soul fan you know listening to a lot of that mm -hmm. uh, you know and it's always incredible to hear guys like you know, the, the, the new producer of jazz, of Neil Soul, it's Robert Gasper. Right. He's incredible. You know, I got to meet him in person and he, you know, mind blowing, you know, and, you know, it's just that I love, I love music, period. I still love my rock music. Anybody that wants to ask me or they ever ask me, so what do you do on the days when you're not listening to house? I listen to a lot of hip hop and, you know, I have my days when I want to hear a lot of rock music. I don't listen to house music like that. You know, I just know how to do house music. You know, anybody that, that always say, oh, what clubs did you go to when you first, you know, learn? I'm like, it really wasn't a club. I never gone to the Paradise Garage. Um, I was going to them suit and tie clubs, you know, where yeah, to dress up, you know, and they played a little bit of everything back then, you know, house, hip hop, you know, it was it was a little bit of everything in a huge club back then, you know, the Palladium, you know, um, you know, it, it was just something to, you know, as a producer, I was always paying attention to the DJ on what it is that they play. Right. You know, and I didn't, you know, I danced. After, you know, after I got my drink on, of course, but I would sit off to the side and I would just stare off at the DJ, listening to everything he played. And back then, you could walk away. You remember that going to a club and you leaving and you know the, the first 10 records that you heard that night. Now you go to a club, you don't know what the hell you just heard. <laughs> it's true. You, you, you don't know what the hell you heard, you know, because a lot of these clubs. You know, if it ain't somebody like, uh, you know, the Pioneer uh, DJs like Louie, you know, Sofa House uh, DJ, you know, or Deep House, you know, you you actually would actually do say, well, man, I heard all of these crazy records that these Deep House um, DJs play. You know, if it's DJ Deep or, you know, MK or Dennis Farrell, or Kerry Chandler, any of them, any of us. Like you played this record, you know, um, it went like this, and somebody trying to actually tell me something that I play, I don't remember. It's just a bunch of good music, you know, that I did. But going to a club, you walking out not knowing what you heard, 
anymore. You know, it used to be the record that set the tone for the for six months. Six months, a record had a lifespan because you would go to these clubs and come out and go, man, I heard these records. It was crazy. Like, you know, and then it's the big record, at least 10 records. And then maybe the top five, top five records. You know, you had these really top five big records that you can actually walk out of the club and go, everybody's playing it. Now you don't see that. You don't see that no more. Follow me, Elias. Drink on me, Kerry Chandler. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, I remember working at nights going, don't make me wait, Peach Boys, my God. Um, you know, running your record. Yeah. It could be, you know, whoever. It's like there was so many records. Crystal Waters, Gypsy Woman, when I first heard that on the tape, when Teddy finished it, it was like, whoa. Yeah. I first heard that at Shelter when uh, Timmy dropped that. Everybody was like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Now it's an anthem, you know. Well, it was an anthem back then, to be and honest. And the record played. Everybody went crazy. Yeah. Well, that was a record that was a standout record. Nothing. That was the first time you heard a Hammond B3 from the gospel organ being so in front, not as a background instrument, but being right up in front and being so signature with the chord progression and her... Off sounding jazz type of vocal was like, yo, home run all night long. Yeah, yeah. The minute she started singing, two weeks in the morning, right. me do a hear you now. Everybody well, starts singing. Hell. And I would just take the music off and make them sing it, you know. And then when then when she goes, um, was she about to say La D? And the crowd would just erupt, like lose their minds to this day. Like I played it. Every gig I've ever played, I've always ran that record because I know when to play it. You know? Yeah, you got to know exactly when to play that record. You can't play it like... No, you don't want to play it 10 minutes set, into your set. You don't want to play it an hour in your set. You want to play it somewhere where you got everybody erupted, you know, where they're there. Just like, oh, you know, all of a sudden, down, 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 down. They're like, oh, everybody starts screaming and... That, you know, like you said, that Hammond keyboard, I mean, uh, organ, it just sets it up and everybody loses it, you know? And I love seeing that because once I do that, that's that's when I officially go, I got him. That's it. And him. that's it, my people. He's taking you all home. Yeah. He's I, got you home. Yeah, I got him, you know? Javon, I think you're going to keep going this. You're not going to stop. The filmmaker, the producer, everything, and now actually grooming and 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 musing the next of our generation to come up in front. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we wish you the best on all that with body and deep and all the stuff you got going on today. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, hopefully the album will be done by the end of this month. I got hopefully, some hopefully, he said, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I'm trying. But I got some really good guests that's going to be on it, some good features. And, um, you know, the last album I did was Timeless in 2018. Um, this particular album, I want it to be special. It's called I Am Music. Um, <clears throat> and it's it's like, it's going to be just a bunch of good music. I, you know, I'm not promising anything to nobody, not looking for no hit. I just want good music. I want it to be diverse to everyone, you know, give something for everybody, you know, where it's accepted as a good album. All know? right. Yeah, no, of course. And you know what? You know, you, they say staying power. You got that in quotations. Staying power. And let's put that out there. There's a reason why. Longevity. Yeah, <laughs> because you still care about it, you know? Yeah. yeah. You still care what people think of what you're doing and how you're doing it, you know? Yeah, the moment yeah. you stop caring, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna do it the same anymore. No, no. Well, you know, my next challenge is, you know, besides just doing the music, I want to definitely get back into film scoring because that's I, what I'm saying. The filmmaker, the film yeah. score guy. Yeah. Yeah, I did three, three film score independent. So I want to do it. I want to do the big screen. I want to do whether if it's a TV show or something. Um, You'll get it, Jovan. Yeah. You'll get it. You'll see. <laughs> you, get it. you know, he sat at those round tables. He had those meetings. I remember we were talking about it a while back. Yeah, yeah, man. 
you know, that's the thing, everyone. You can't give up. You got to keep at it. You know, scratch, keep scratching at it, scratch at it, because eventually it will come. But if you get the minute, you know, the biggest thing is, is how many people work so hard to get to that line and they get so close to that line to step over it, and they just stop mm. at the finish line and fall down. Yeah. And then somebody else comes running through and they win. And that, so you have to say, as tired as you are at the end, you got to find that last piece of energy to keep going. If you're bleeding and dying, you know, you got to find it because that's what's going to keep you in this and keep you there as a champion, you know, player in this game. Oh. On that note, Javon, we wish you all the success with Body and Deep and Max Jax and all that stuff coming up and the new album to come back again and tell us on True House Stories the next part after 30 more years. <laughs> we'll check it again and again with you later on, part two. And when it's 60 years now, we'll say, okay, now where are you at now? <laughs> We're going to be all grayed up and probably cursing like a thousand times. Yeah, I effing this and I effing that. And you know, I freaking blah, blah, blah. And Blue Blue just bleep me out because he's. Beep, beep. Vinny is going to be on a major TV show. I see it coming. It's going to happen. Um, I. Yo, I applaud you for doing what you're doing. You, you're doing something big. And if any of you people, VH1, whatever the hell you are, y'all watching right now, check for him. Check out for this dude, you know, because he got something going on to speak about real house music, true house music, nothing underneath the tables. This is like straight up real. No, we can't get any more real than this. We tell it as it is. And on that note, everyone, we're going to go next week to Europe to talk to a European producer, De Hoffner. And we want to thank Mr. Jovan from Body and Deep, Gold Tone, Warner Brothers, all the success back to Zanzibar, Brooklyn, Jersey, Paris, and the world. Jovan, right here on True House Stories. Good night, everyone. And thank you again for tuning in. Peace. <laughs>